system, you get the second guy involved. Now, if you were to assay the physicists, by doing the first two experiments, you would have reasoned as follows. You would have reasoned, look, A, now, suppose you were asked by your student to predict what would happen if you kept both slits open. You would say, well, that's simple. Every electron goes through one slit or the other. So the probabilities will just average out of add. If the work we're going to get with the intensity curve is the sum of those two curves, so you can imagine that it would be something like that. Just by adding up the curves there and there, you'd imagine that the electrons that go to the first slit give you the first bump, the electrons that go to the second slit give you the second bump. It's roughly equal probability of the electron to go through either slit. So you just add. That's what every classical physicist, every physicist before 1900 would have said, and it's dead wrong. If you do the experiment, this is what you find. This is terribly weird shape. Now, we understand why that happens using the mathematical rules of quantum mechanics. But to say it works is because it's just not true that any given electron goes through either one hole or the other. As we said, the electron is not located in a particular position. Any given electron goes through both holes. And the interference of these two possibilities gives you this weird pattern. It's basically wave interference, for those of you who don't know. Okay, let's go on. So actually, please. Is, is, is this uh, Exactly. It's it, precisely. You see, this is the young, young double split uh, interference pattern, and would happen for any any wave. Uh, well, the fact that the probability of the electron is governed by a wave. the probability of the electron is governed by a wave equation immediately gives you this rough shape. Okay. Yes. So suppose you were to have an electron carrying one electron. Yes. What would happen? You still see the same. No. If you shoot one electron, you would see the electron would. Oh, Say 10 to the minus 20 meters, 
It may be fluctuating, but since you can't measure those small scales, you don't see it fluctuating. For, as for practical purposes, it's located at a given position. That it turns out that in the geometry of space time, that's the situation. The fluctuations are very small in all practical situations that we encounter in the real world, but they become B in extreme situations. Okay, so, you know, I gave you on this slide this analogy of cricket ball. A cricket, you know, the position of cricket ball is fluctuating this quantum wave, but it's so small that when Sachin Tendulkar wants to hit a six, he doesn't care. You know, it's, it's irrelevant for that problem. <laughs> Everything fluctuates, but both are so small. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, in the same way, if you want to predict the evolution, you know, the motion of the Earth around the Sun, the Earth's position is fluctuating a little bit, but you can ignore it. It's a minute effect. But there are certain circumstances under which this is not a minute effect, but a dominant effect. Now, you might think, look, this is typical of physicists. You search for weird circumstances, which you never encounter. Who cares? Okay, the reason we care so much about this, this particular thing is that these quantum fluctuations are very important, a very, very important epoch in the universe, yeah. namely its birth. You see, we, we know quite well now that, uh, that the universe, we know by certain mechanism, I won't tell you how, that the universe about 13.6 billion years ago started out in a very hot and dense, hot and dense, situation and whoosh, expanded out fast. Oh, and this initial hot and dense situation, uh, very, very small, smaller than anything experiments have ever encountered. Well, no, very, very small. And it's, 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 uh, uh, and the explosion out of that is called the Big Bang. Uh, we know, we, you know, where, how do we know this? This happened 30.6 billion years ago, it's a long time ago. How do we know what happened so long ago? We know it by the laws of physics. You know, what you can do is measure the universe as we see it now and use the laws of physics to run the movie backwards. And as long as the laws of physics work, the laws that we use are classical Einstein in general relativity. You can run the universe backwards until it comes to this very small hot and dense shape. And then you can ask, what happened before that? What happened before this thing was very, very small, just didn't go to point? Did the universe have a beginning? Was the universe created? These are basic and fundamental questions that all of us want to know the answer to. The answer is, we don't know. We don't know because at this point, it turns out these quantum fluctuations of space-time geometry become more important than the classical effects that Einstein talked us about. And in order to know what happened before that, we need to know the correct theory of quantum fluctuations of space-time. Without this theory, we cannot answer the question about how did I do this? Now, this is a question all of us want to know the answer to. It's the kind of question that people presumably 50,000 years ago looking up in the sky wondered how did it all begin. We want to know the answer to that question. We cannot know it without knowing the correct theory of quantum fluctuations in space time. So for this reason, as well as a few others, we want to know this theory. We want to understand how space time geometry behaves when it's not is what we can. Okay. Um, now, okay, I think I it's three minutes more. Okay. Um, you see, part one and two are over. Now part three. Part three is the shortest of the three parts because we understand not so much about it. <laughs> okay. uh, um, it's about the search for the quantum theory of space time. I've convinced you, I hope, that we need a quantum theory, that fluctuating theory of geometry of space time. What is that theory? Well, you see, this situation was encountered before in the history of physics. All the theories prior to the 1900s were classical theories, where things had definite positions, or velocities. Then quantum mechanics came up and we realized things should fluctuate. Question. You've got a whole body of physics that's based on things with definite positions and velocities. Do you give that all up and start fresh? <laughs> but you somehow modify those old theories to be quantum mechanical. And of course, if this is so pragmatic. You take something that works and try to generalize it to work better. So of course what people try to do is to make generalized theories in which the variables were the same. The variables that were the same that you used with the classical theory, but just they were allowed to fluctuate. And every three, basically most cases that worked, that worked very well. For instance, the theory of quantum electrodynamics gives beautiful experimental results. All you do is take the classical theory of electrodynamics and let things fluctuate in a certain way, and it works. So the natural guess is to try to take, try to do the same thing with space-time. Einstein has given us a great theory of classical space-time. Let's try to make these variables fluctuate in some standard way. 
You try that, and it doesn't work. What do I mean by it doesn't work? I don't mean that it doesn't give results that are consistent with the experiment, because it's very hard to make experiments in nature this thing. I mean that it doesn't work in the sense that the theory you get appears not to be mathematically consistent. Okay, so if you, the process that works for every other theory does not give you a theory. So it's not a question of whether it's right or wrong, it's just nonsense. At least that's what it seems to most of us. There are some physicists who believe that it does give you a theory and we just haven't understood it correctly. Perhaps they're right, but all the evidence points.